Welcome to Steam Powered, where I have conversations with women in Steam to learn a little bit about what they do and who they are. My guest today is Karen Stark. Karen is an advocate for renewable energy in the farming sector and has founded the National Renewables and Agriculture Conference. She has a background in environmental science and sustainable development and has also worked in projects relating to sustainable transport. Join us as we talk about art, the London Cycle Hire Scheme, and renewable energy in agriculture. So, hi, thank you for joining me, Karen. This is hopefully going to work given all of our tech troubles this morning. Um, so, yes, you studied environmental science and sustainable development, uni. And where did you think that was going to take you when you first started? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I've always, ever since I was really little, I've always been interested in the natural world and conserving the natural world and in particular in animals. And I was a bit of an animal rights activist. So I initially started Murdoch um, studying biological sciences, but halfway through the first um, semester, I realised I'd have to dissect a lot of animals and that goes against my values of what of how I think we should be treating animals. So I went to talk to the dean or the professor and he said to me, you might as well just change to environmental science because you, you know, it's going to be very hard for you to get out of doing that type of work. And I guess I'm not big in being in laboratories and stuff like that anyway. So I changed to environmental science and it was the right road for me because that has opened up a lot of opportunities. Um, and I guess I was hoping I could work in conservation, to be honest. Um, the bush regeneration, animal conservation, stuff like that. When you finished graduating from that, how like where did you go from there? Well, I had a year off, so I went over to the UK with a couple of friends. And at that stage, I had no idea how to actually um, look at professional work over there. So I worked in a ski mm -hmm. shop and pubs and stuff like that. And we travelled Europe together. So I came back, and what I what I had done at university was volunteer. Um, with a program called Travel Smart, and that was with the Department of Environment in Perth. And because of that volunteering, um, I sent my CV out to lots of different environmental organisations, not knowing what I would do, and they recognised my name and they invited me to come in for an interview. Um, and I was actually interviewed by my partner now, my husband, John, my partner, <laughs> um, and, and our manager in a role in community um, based social marketing, so community education, and trying to get people not to use single occupancy vehicle cars. So that was kind of my mm -hmm. first professional role. And how did that lead you to all the bike programs that you um, handled in London, the London Cycle Hire Scheme? Yep, so because I was working in sustainable transport and getting people to cycle and walk and use public transport rather than uh, single occupancy vehicles, cars, um, because of pollution and um, and smog and issues we had in Perth, I knew someone over in the UK who said that there was a shortage occupation at the moment in transport consultancy, so I could actually get a visa for five years to work over in the UK in, in transport. Um, because I'd already used my two-year working visa, I, it was the only opportunity I had to go over to the UK again. So I moved over to the UK and, and worked in environmental management for a while, but then a job came up at Transport for London, looking at travel awareness campaigns, so similar to what I did in Perth, so trying to encourage people to use the tube or cycle or walk. Um, and within the same Transport um, for London, there was a role that came up with the, it's called the, the cycle London Cycle High Scheme at that stage before yeah. we had a sponsor and it was called um, Barclay Cycle High and then everyone just called it Boris Bikes at that time. <laughs> so that was a massive um, cycle infra public infrastructure program, 3,000 bicycles in central London, um, that would go into docking stations and people could use them to cycle. Um, you know, we had stations every 300 metres. So it was a fantastic program to be involved in and it actually created huge behaviour change as well. Um, yeah. But it was yeah, it was revolutionising the way people travelled in, in London, which was very exciting. Uh, yeah, it was amazing, like, hearing about all of the changes that were taking place just to make that happen. But what sort of things were involved in getting that sort of program running? It's a massive, massive um, infrastructure program, public awareness program, because Transport for London, which is a government organisation, had to work with all the boroughs within central London to choose sites that would be um, safe and, you know, that would be highly, um, foot would have high footfall uh, for people to yeah. be able to, 
yeah, and like visibility and safety and everything to be able to see these docking stations, cycle around and know where to return them. It was also the first time a scheme like this had been launched in, in the UK or in London in particular. So it was, a, it was trying to teach a whole new behaviour to people. And we weren't going to have, it's not like where you catch the tubes where there's people in the station um, to help you with that. It's just these mm-hmm. kind of public, you know, docking stations all over the place with bicycles. Stations everywhere, yeah. You can't can't place people at every one of these things just to tell people how it works. Yeah, exactly. So it was this massive marketing campaign, which is kind of what I was involved in. I particularly um, led the delivery of a roadshow, which had um, examples of what the bikes would look like, had information about how it worked, um, got people kind of razzed up. We went to different festivals in London. In thing, um, we went to Trafalgar Square where there's high footfall. Yeah. Um, and I actually did also coordinate 600 volunteers for the first four days of launch, I think it was, um, to stand at the very popular spots that we thought people would be at to explain and help um, our new kind of bike users to understand how to use the scheme. So. Um, but after that, people were on their own pretty much. <laughs> but, yeah, it was, it was a really program, really. Yeah. So over here, like, we've got those issues with having, like, the legal issues with having to wear helmets when you're actually riding bikes. So how – did you have yeah. issues with that kind of thing over there as well or was, was, that, an, was that a problem? Um, no. So that's also a very interesting question because when I worked in Perth, um, we – I was in sustainable travel and wearing helmets is compulsory and I got pulled up by the cops a couple of times for not wearing a helmet when I came to work across the bridge, you know, the yeah, yeah. big park to there. Um, so when the helmet law in Perth was introduced, there was a reduction in 30% of people cycling to work wow. for whatever reason that is. Wow. And the actual health benefit of people cycling outweighs the risk of um, them having an accident. So that was actually – for me, not a step in the right direction. And I think children should wear helmets and, you know, Australia is very regulated, I guess, in terms of um, making sure that people are very conscious of health and safety. So in the UK and places like the Netherlands, they have massive amounts of cycling, really high proportion of people cycle to work every day and they don't wear helmets because it's not compulsory. Some do, some don't, it's up to them. But because they have so many cyclists on the street, the number of accidents is actually lower Per, per, per capita than it is in somewhere like Australia. So yeah. in the UK and London, there's no cycle helmet law. So you didn't have that barrier of entry, barrier to entry for that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You could be a tourist. You could be coming out of a, a meeting and needing to get back to your office and you might see a cycle high bike. You can just jump on and use it. Whereas in Australia, when they introduced these cycle high schemes in Melbourne and Sydney, I'm not sure if there's any in Perth, but yeah the barrier was people just had to be prepared and think ahead and go I need to bring a helmet with me and you know lots of people spoke about why don't you leave helmets with the cycle high bikes for people to use but as soon as one of those helmets are dropped it loses its integrity and yeah hygiene and all those reasons it doesn't work as well when you have a helmet law in place. Which is really unfortunate because you know you want them to use it but you also want them to be safe. Yeah Yeah. and and I have to people that have said they've fallen off their bikes and if they weren't wearing a helmet they would have cracked their skulls but instead it cracked the helmet so it is it is obviously safe to one but it should be up to the person I think yeah so after the London cycle hire scheme you came back here Mm -hmm. and you moved out into rural New South Wales became a farmer and yeah now you're working on renewable energy resources for agriculture how did that happen yeah, so that's right. So I went from busy living on Portobello Road <laughs> to living on a farm where our closest neighbour is about a 10-minute drive. <laughs> so very isolated. But, um, you know, I, I think I've adapted relatively well to that and I quite like the bush we have around the farm. But yeah. so I guess I've been able, I've been very lucky to be able to combine my environmental science and kind of conservation background with, with agriculture And I was working, I've worked in lots of different roles since I've been in New South Wales. One of them was um, the Office of Environment Heritage, which is a New South Wales state government organisation. And I was a regional coordinator looking at how do we increase generation of renewables in New South Wales. And as part of that, um, my partner had mentioned that there was a guy coming into Narromine town. Narromine is our closest town. It's about half an hour away. It's about 2,500 people um, to talk about using solar to pump because we use a lot of diesel on our farm to pump water 
So this guy showed up, he met someone in Sydney, a farmer, who said, oh, yeah, you know, we need to cut our costs. He showed up expecting there to be four or five other farmers at the pub to talk about solar pumping, and there was 30 or 40. So oh, there's wow. obviously a lot of interest in yeah. cutting diesel costs or electricity costs and replacing it with something like solar, particularly because the cost of solar has come down so significantly over the last 10 years. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so when I was with the government um, organisation, I ran a few seminars inviting people from New South Wales farms that were looking into the theory of solar pumping and if it could be done. Um, and we attracted 50 to 60 farmers to places out Warren, like in these kind of very small towns. And to get a farmer to travel and give up a whole day's work is not an easy feat. Yeah, definitely. It's a massive ask. Yeah. So it showed that there's a real demand for that information, but not any systems for farmers to mm. learn from. So I guess from there it grew. So I kind of changed jobs and worked for land care and things like that. Um, and so on our farm, if I just explain a bit about what we do, we grow cotton. And yeah, yeah, tell me. Yep, two and a half thousand hectares. Cotton's where we make our money. Um, we have a groundwater license and a river license. And the river license, you know, because of the drought, we, we haven't had any of that allocation over the last couple of years, two or three years, and barely anyone has. But we're very lucky to have groundwater. So that groundwater allows us to grow the cotton crop every year, which is what is most profitable for us to do with the water we have. Because mm -hmm. cotton can be quite controversial. I don't know if you want to, if you have any questions about that, answer them as well. But um, well, you can talk to it. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess well, there's a view that cotton is a very thirsty plant, and you know that we shouldn't be using so much water to produce cotton, but. Cotton itself, um, it grows well in, in desert climates, but it's not the actual plant that a farmer grows is not the issue. It's the water license and the and the river license. Yes. Who's using that water and how much have you got and whether that's sustainable. So and those issues are very complex. But our groundwater is highly monitored and highly managed. And New South Wales Water has got several test. Um, bores all around our valley which look at how the groundwater is behaving in a in, during the irrigation season and also during droughts so if they see the water table dropping too far they will you know stop irrigators from taking too much um, we're also very lucky that our groundwater is very deep it's about 80 meters below the surface and there's no connectivity between the Macquarie River which is one of our closest rivers and our groundwater so you know as the as our groundwater gets pumped each year it's not reducing you know because there's no connectivity it's not reducing the, the the river water and me being an environmentalist you know I've got I, I see both views you know I, I want to make sure there's enough water in yeah. rivers for the fish and for the wetlands so it's given yeah I've got a quite unique perspective I suppose on the water issues of farm but um so we're spending with the groundwater we're spending about three hundred thousand dollars on diesel um, to pump that water licence every year to grow cotton. And that was the highest mm -hmm. operating cost on our farm. So so once I was working, I think I'd left um, the Office of Environment Heritage and was working for Landcare, and we had a company called Reacqua come and speak to us, well, my partner and his dad, about putting a, a large-scale solar, solar irrigation pump that would be a hybrid model with diesel to cut our diesel costs, mm -hmm. to cut emissions and that had a very strong business case. So when you don't even look at the emissions, it's a, it was a five-year payback, putting in the 500 yeah. of solar, um, not having to use diesel as much to fill our reservoirs. Um, and, you know, John and Rock decided to, Rock being my father-in-law, decided to go with it. So we've got the largest solar diesel irrigation pump in Australia. Um, and we like because <laughs> we made up that category and named ourselves as the biggest. <laughs> but we are the biggest. <laughs> but it's a real step change. For, <laughs> Just to be clear. Yeah. I mean, no one else has tried to get anything, but anyway. Um, it's a real step change for, for large-scale irrigation to be able to replace so much of that diesel with, with solar. And one of the things that, you know, I feel very positive about is we've been able to reduce our CO2 emissions by about 500 tonnes a year. And that's one farmer doing that. That's incredible. Yeah, so you think, you know, there's a lot of, wow. for me, I feel like there's a lot of noise around solar rooftop or doing this for houses and stuff. But that's one farmer reducing 500 tonnes of CO2 a year, which is about 40 households yeah. worth of energy. So you've got to think if 10 more farmers do that in the next 10 years, that's 
heaps of some significant reduction of emissions that we can achieve. Definitely, especially because like agriculture is such a massive part of our industry, you know, in the entire country, providing everything for export domestic use. So how many other farmers yeah. have been showing interest in establishing these? Have there been any other um, farmers setting up arrays like yours? Uh, yes, so there's been a few smaller ones. When we launched the scheme in September 2018, we had about 100 community members. Um, we had media there and some peak bodies and government representatives come along. So there have been, there's been a huge amount of interest. Um, but actually not that many systems that I've heard of that are going in, particularly the size that we've got, which I suppose led me to my next venture, which is the um, organising the National Renewables and Agriculture Conference. And yes. um, I did that because <laughs> uh, there's obviously the interest from farmers in how does renewables cut our costs, build business resilience and reduce emissions, but not enough examples where farmers can look over the fence and see what their neighbours are doing and, and see that it's working and do it, do it, do it themselves. <clears throat> and I've learned that that's living out here. Farmers mm -hmm. like to hear from other farmers. They, they're of quite course. independent people. They can be quite cynical. Um, so they want to hear from other farmers and what they've done and how it worked and what they learned. So that was, I guess, a nat natural progression in my career to say, well, you know, let, let's do this massive conference, but not just about solely irrigating, but let's bring in battery storage, bioenergy on in a piggery, a carbon yeah. neutral winery in the valley. And it went really well. So we got um, 250 people to the inaugural event last mm -hmm. year, which was held in Wagga Wagga. Um, really positive vibes. Um, the first speaker was from ANU and he was talking about Australia as a renewable energy powerhouse. And like yes. you were saying, you know, agriculture, exports well we could be exporting renewable energy because we have so much sunlight in this country we have exactly. space there's hydrogen. yeah so there's it's quite exciting what what can what farmers can get involved in in with their own property but also they could be hosting you know these massive solar farms and selling energy overseas and we could yeah. be helping with the global emission target really that's great so you're getting a lot of those interstate um, interest coming in through for the conference as well? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yep. So it's a national conference. We had speakers from every single other state except for the except for Northern Territory. Um, yep. And we also had a lot, a lot of farmers or businesses that were interested um, traveling from different states to come to the conference. So it's a pretty much the only um, forum or event that I know of that people interested in the ag and renewable energy space can come together and meet and learn and show st and share stories. Definitely. And it, it allows them to expand what they're doing, especially in times of like drought or flood and stuff like that. It's, it's, you can still get all of the energy stuff going, even with all the other stuff happening as well. Exactly. So that's a good point. So it's one that I try and make a lot, which is when farmers, particularly when they host wind turbines, for example, or mm -hmm. when they host a solar farm on part of their property, that's giving them a secondary income that during a drought when they might not have, if they're dryland farmers or they're graziers, they have cattle or sheep, they don't get much of an income at all from their yeah. primary production. So that's yeah. why having that buffer of this leasing your land and getting money for that um, from the solar developer or the wind turbines, you can get up to 18000 per turbine, for example, that mm -hmm. is really helping some farms I've spoken to to um be able to do other things with their business or expand or not have that stress that they will have no income for a year. Yeah. So that is another point. That's amazing. Like it's, it's such a great area for them to go into because of how much space that they've got in general for all the other work that they normally do. Yeah, exactly. That's the way I see it. I mean, there has, there is, it is a little bit controversial at the moment about, um, <laughs> it's always controversial. Ag land because, <laughs> well, when I first started with government, the controversy the controversy was around wind turbines and the health impacts of the yes. whatever turbines or whatever, but which ended up, you know, there was not, not, no basis to that. But there was no opposition to solar farms, but there weren't many large-scale solar farms when I was working for the government, you know, five years ago. But now we have these three renewable energy zones for New South Wales um, mm -hmm. that have been um, designated to, you know, have these massive 3,000 megawatt um, solar plants or wind or pumped hydro. And 
there have been some opponents that have talked about, well, that high value agricultural land shouldn't be converted for solar and then be locked up for 30 years. Right. So while I think that is a genuine concern, I think it can be worked around because there are things like agrivoltaics, which is happening in Japan, in Austria, in Italy, and they grow crops under the solar panels. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a Reddit recently about transparent solar um, panels which allow the light through so that it actually can help with the production of crops as well. So you can actually, solar and agriculture, particularly grazing, which is happening already, lots of sheep keeping yeah. the weeds down under the solar panels, it can coexist in a really um, positive manner and it's a win-win situation. It doesn't have to be one or the other, like you have exactly. a solar farm then you don't anymore. So I guess I see that as something that we Australian probably needs to move a bit more into um, that mm -hmm. other countries have done already, but we've had so much space in the past. We didn't need to worry about that, you know, one or the other land conflict issue. So given that only a few of the smaller farms have been picking up the solar panels, have any of the other industries like the pig farmers and the wineries been in, showing any interest in renewable alternatives? Yep. So the dairy industry um, has been have been leading, I suppose, in terms of solar use for their for their dairy sheds and for mm -hmm. keeping um, keeping their milking vats cool and and also there's quite a few wineries that because they often market their product direct at the farm the gate or to consumers mm -hmm. they want to be also more um, be seen as being more environmentally friendly and carbon neutral and, and a lot of the wine regions need the cooler weather like in the Hunter and the wine industry is being highly affected by climate change, so they see yes. a need to to yes. be reducing their emissions and using, you know, solar or renewables and other ways of cutting emissions. So that because they're being directly impacted now, really, yes, as are a lot of other agricultural yeah. sectors, but the, the wine industry in particular. That's brilliant. So with the leasing of the land for solar panels and wind turbines, um, I, I assume that. Like none of the farmers have to actually do anything with that. So it will be external contractors coming in to manage and maintain all of those things for them. They just need to provide the land and that's all? Yep, that, that's correct. They might have some obligations in terms of keeping the weeds down. It just depends yeah. on the contract between the landholder and the solar proponent. And and I guess that's the type of thing. New South Wales farmers have an excellent guide out for yeah. landholders they want to host renewables yeah. because there's a lot to that's understand brilliant. in terms of impact yeah. With const when construction and new roads that might be built for wind turbines or, you know, what are the contractual um, things you need to look out for. But generally, yeah, once they've leased the land, they can either graze their sheep if that's something that's been negotiated and continue to access that land. Otherwise, I believe they probably just might need to keep the weeds down and their stock out of out of it if it's, if it's cattle because they can be quite <laughs> damaging to the infrastructure. <laughs> yes, of course. With Riaco, because you're working with them as well, aside from raising awareness, what other kind of roles do they have in getting the farmers on board with adding this infrastructure in? Yep, yeah, so Riaco, um, are, their main bread and butter would be livestock solar pumps. So it's replacing either diesel or the old windmills that you see that pump water up to livestock um, troughs around Australia, yeah. and it's replacing yeah. with solar because there's very low maintenance needs. You don't need to go up there and fill up diesel all the time. Um, so they've been very successful with that. They sell a product called Lorentz, which is a German engineered product, but they've got a factory in Beijing. Um, but, but obviously they're, they're getting into the large scale solar irrigation market as well. And they've done a orange orchard in Gunnada, I think it was, um, or near Tamworth, where instead of connecting to the grid for this new orchard, um, by going solar, they were cash positive from the beginning because it would have cost them over I think 50 to 90,000 to have a new grid connection and then obviously there's the cost of electricity every every year for for irrigating the um, orchard plants but by going solar and pretty much off grid they've already saved um, that ongoing cost plus the connection fees and everything else so yeah so that's pretty much what they're doing and you know I've helped react with things like working with CSIRO to look at solar forecasting technology where they have an eye, like a 360-degree eye that um, can can predict every, I think, five minutes exactly where the clouds are going to be and when it's going to cover a solar array, and then you can then 
use that intelligence to to make better decisions on when to use a diesel generator or turn it on now and start warming it up because it's going to be a massive cloud event in wow. 15 minutes or don't turn it on, it's only a quick one. Yeah, it's quite, it was quite an interesting project. That's incredible. There's so much technology involved in just getting, you know, that kind of analytics going. Gosh. So you've had to delay the conference for this year because of all the quarantine coronavirus stuff. What's the, what's the next plan or what's the next stage for the conference? Yep. So, um, yeah, obviously it wasn't a great, great year to start a conference <laughs> business. <laughs> yeah. So that's been postponed until May the 19th next year in Dubbo. Um, mm-hmm. And we've got quite a few farmers lined up, some really interesting ones as well that um, one of them who is is using the biogas from their piggery as well, which is a bit similar to oh, the one last year, awesome. but she's selling energy back into the grid. Yeah, That's so that cool. I find that type of stuff because it's using a waste product to produce energy to run yeah, your definitely. farm. You know, it's that kind of circular um, loop that you want to be, um, if you want to be sustainable, that's kind of the way to go. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah. Got, anyway, I've got lots of, I'm trying to think of the other speakers. <laughs> oh, I've got, got a speaker on um, hydrogen energy and how in the future it might be a fantastic way for farmers who have got solar and water to produce energy, store it, and power their their farm vehicles with it. And we're actually looking at that with our large-scale solar system as well at the moment. So, that's yeah, amazing. lots of fantastic speakers, even electric utes. I've got a speaker that's going to come and talk about an electric ute that you might be able to power with your solar panels. So, yeah, starting to – the message is starting to get out there. That's cool. Like, just being able to get them completely off the grid, that's amazing. That's fantastic news. Yeah. It's, there's lots of, lots of new research and fantastic – innovative leaders out there in the community the farmers doing fantastic things it's just a matter of getting them together in something like my conference and sharing those stories allowing other farmers to ask questions and make connections with either businesses that I might have at the conference which are um, part of the expo and I've tried to look at um, credible businesses because that is a massive barrier as well to farmers investing in renewables is a lack of trust in suppliers and you can't blame them because some of them get four or five solar is, um, installers calling them saying oh yeah we'd love to come and put solar on your on your shed but there's there needs to be an understanding of ag and the operations around ag and the patterns of energy use which is very different to a business in town or house residential so definitely yeah so, so therefore even if they're a great business a great solar installer they might not have that ag understanding so there needs to be yeah. smarter designs with how we use renewables within an agricultural setting and um, some of those consultants or businesses come to my conference as part of the expo so farmers can speak to them on the day about what opportunities there are. That's that's brilliant. So at least that way you're going to be able to get those people who are in the commercial residential solar space learning a bit more about how they can help the agricultural yeah. community. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, you've, there's so much support in New South Wales and a lot of infrastructure for this. Um, is that spreading to the other states as well? Um, well, Queensland and Victoria have had um, ag energy farm audits um, for the last few years at New South Wales. I yeah. don't have that yet, but those yeah. help a farmer to identify where they're using energy, where they can save energy via you know, energy efficiency and also where renewables might be a good solution. Um, and once that farmer has that information, it really helps them, I suppose, know that they've got a credible independent report that they can make decisions based on data and um, and scientific evidence rather than a solar installer coming saying, I can cut your costs, let me put, <laughs> you know, solar on your paddock or whatever. Um, yeah. But, yeah, so there are thing, a lot of things happening in other states as well. So there's a group in WA called Ag Zero 2030, and that's a group of farmers that have come together to try and reduce their, you know, be, be um, carbon neutral by 2030. Um, and right. they're looking at things like renewables as well as a way to achieve that. Hopefully they'll keep growing then now that, well, once people can start being a little bit more mobile to actually get to these conferences. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the hope. That's the hope. <laughs> a few of the other um, people I've spoken to, they've been taking their conferences online, but clearly with our tech issues, that's probably not going to be viable for a lot of people at the moment. <laughs> yeah, people in my committee. So I've got... On my conference committee, I've got um, lots of great representatives um, and a couple of them said, oh, why don't you do an online, you know, yeah. conference? So I said, you know, I can barely do a Zoom call without interrupting. <laughs> Let 
organize a whole conference with speakers and farmers don't have the best, most reliable internet. So it's just no, isn't going to work. Yeah. Farmers are very about face-to-face interactions as well. Of course. So, um, yeah, I'd rather. It's about building trust and rapport. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's good to hear about all the ways that these technologies can help our farmers normally, as well as when they need it the most. Yeah, exactly. And there's, there's, you know, a really big push now to have a renewables led recovery after COVID because, you know, we can create 50,000 jobs just by um, supporting the new renewables industry and giving that kind of um, certainty to investors that Australia is, is wanting to push on with renewables rather than fossil fuels. And a lot of the coal powered fire stations are retiring in 20 to 30 years. So it's not really the time to be investing in fossil fuel technologies or, you know, even gas, really, (laughs) dare I say it. (laughs) No, it's not. Okay, well, uh, because you have to get going soon, we'll get on to, there were a few extra questions that I'd like to ask you, which are unrelated to what you do for work. Uh, So what hobby or interest do you have that's most unrelated to what you do? Probably um, my art, I'd say. Um, My dad, as you'd know, is a very um, beautiful artist. He's, you know, just very skilled and talented in that stuff. So I suppose from learning from him a little bit when I was a child, I loved to paint with oils and watercolours. So I'd say that would be my creative outlet, I suppose, in a way. Um, I don't do a lot of it because I've got a six-year-old daughter and kind of work (laughs) and do that and help a bit on the farm. Um, It doesn't leave much time, but um, that would be... Once I do get a lot of time, it will be something I'd like to spend a lot more time doing. So you've been doing, like, you've been doing oils, like, just recently or? Hmm. Yeah, I could show you a few. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, just. <laughs> uh, you don't have to do it what, now. Don't really grab it? No, you don't have to do it now. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, that's probably my hobby that's most unrelated to my work. A lot of the women in our family seem to love the art side as well. Very artistic. Yeah. Mostly, the guys. Do you do art? mostly the girls yeah so I used to do oh, quite a bit of art um drawing a bit of watercolors not terribly good and haven't oh. done it in ages but it's you know it's just something that I've always done but of course it wasn't a it wasn't a oh, career okay. that was actually going to go anywhere and make me money so it became a hobby <laughs> <laughs> and uh which childhood book holds the strongest memories for you um there's a really new age hippie one that my dad read to us a lot called The Magical Rainbow Man. <laughs> and I read it to my oh, my sister reads oh, it to wow. her sons. Oh. But I love that one because firstly, back then, my dad would have got it from one of those shops that sell all those crystals and have incense burning. Um, you know, it had the three children that are talking to this magical rainbow man that's in the sky. They're of the three three different ethnicities so there's a child of color there's an Asian one and then there's like a red-headed girl so I just thought when I look at it now I didn't notice it as a child but when I look at it now I just think oh that's beautiful that they you know used a really representative you know mix of children you know all being friends and and being culturally diverse but um, it's I guess it's special because it talks about the different colors in the rainbow and all, it's just really positive and um, talks about how important love is and how you have to show love when this, you know, when the sky is darkest because that's when you need it the most, like symbolically. Oh. But um, yeah, that that I'd say that book is probably meant the most, and that I that I love. You know, my partner rolls his eyes when I get it. <laughs> <It's a bit laughs> um, I really love it. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful that both you and your sister like read it to your children now as well. That it's just carried forward to the next generation. Yeah, that, yeah, and I, I really my sweet. dad actually, yeah, my dad gave <laughs> my sister a copy of the original, um, oh. and then I got an email saying, well, how come she got the original? <laughs> no, I can't read it. So he went and bought, tried to find it online, even though it's out of print, and managed to find a very expensive copy, I think. <laughs> so anyway, very sweet, but I really wanted it to read to my to, my, to Nora as well. So we should have just kept it at your house, and then we could read it to our kids every time we came, but anyway (laughs) that's okay it's good that it's something that you can share Mm. as well and last one before we wrap up what advice would you give someone who wants to you know get into what you do which is a little bit broad because you've had a few different jobs and moved on a little bit I think 
you know, doing that volunteer work I did when I was at university got me a foot in the door for my first career job. And I think there's nothing like um, getting your face known and understanding who's who in the industry by volunteering while, at, while you're at university. Um, and also I think being open and a lot of the jobs I've had have been people have notified me that um, are in my network, like I don't hear about these jobs being advertised if I'm looking for one and people go, oh, there's one, you know, it's a network job here or there's an environmental thing there. So I think having a very strong network and keeping in touch with people that you get along well with in past jobs, I've done that a lot, not necessarily for my career, but just because I like them or my old bosses, I really like them. Yeah. Um, so that's really helped with, I guess, you know, them hearing of things and then you might then be told about them and have the opportunity to go for them. But I think generally being quite open to what comes your way. So I, when I first left university, I didn't want to work in sustainable transport. Like I said, I wanted to do nature conservation or, you know, reveg or animal stuff. But working in that sustainable transport, like I ended up really loving it because it's about um, psych the psychology of people and how do you get them to change behaviour and, you know, how do we um, create change by setting people up um, with others that want to create change or by addressing their barriers with, with different incentives or information or whatever it might be. So I suppose that, uh, that those skills that I learned are all transferable to other, other jobs that I had and that I went to. But, um, yeah, I'd say that's probably my advice. Definitely. Anything that they shouldn't listen to. Yeah. Well, when I first um, wanted to go into university and study, you know, biological sciences or ended up doing environmental science my mum um being Asian as well didn't help but she said there's no jobs in the environment there's no job in the environment don't do it there's no job in the environment but and at that time the environment wasn't high on the agenda in government policy or in the media or there weren't that many you know not-for-profits that worked on this area so there probably wasn't as many jobs as there are now but because um I am passionate about it I did you know, follow what I wanted to, what I felt I wanted to do with my life. And that's worked out really well for me, really, in the end. So yeah. um, if anyone tells you there's no jobs in it. You don't know. Do you, do you, and believe in yourself. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's also a running theme that we've been having as well. Like you don't know okay. where you're going to end up. Just keep your options open. And a yeah. lot of jobs that we have now didn't exist then. So yeah, you never know if exactly. a new, something new in the industry that you're interested in is going to make a job for you and you'll find that space. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, there definitely weren't the number of jobs and the variety for environmental science people like me when I left uni at all. So, yeah, there, there definitely are now. <laughs> yeah, cool. That's good advice. <laughs> All right, well, we'll let you get going. Thank you so much for this. This has been really fascinating and learning about all the ways that renewables can be used in agriculture. It's such a massive industry that's just going to keep growing. I hope so. And thank you so much for having me on. Awesome. This has been great. Very good. Yeah, yeah so you I'm are interesting. Sure. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. That's very really nice. You might think so because you're family, but thank you. <laughs> Other people. But anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks. With climate change having such a great impact on agriculture, not to mention everywhere else, it's fascinating to see the way that renewable energy is being utilised in the sector, not only to cut costs and carbon emissions, but in some cases to also close the loop. To learn more about what Kara and I discussed on this show, or to connect with us, please visit the Steam Powered website at steampoweredshow.com. You can also reach out to Karen on Twitter at KarenStark79, as well as her conference website, which I'll include in the show notes. If you enjoyed this conversation, please let me know. Subscribe to the channel, leave a comment below, and share this with your geeky and geekiest friends. Thanks for watching. <laughs>